actual correctional services. You know the ministry is called the Ministry of Correctional Services, but I'm not sure what it's doing to correct uh, anything. And um, then we did talk about judicial discretion. The, the government is arguing that judicial discretion is excessive, um, leading to inconsistencies in sentencing, especially between provinces. Um, but that's the whole point of the judiciary, that they have the, that discretion. Okay? So if there's a problem with judges and how they're dealing with, how they're dealing with uh, being consistent, then that's what should be addressed. It shouldn't be that we take the power away from them. Um, and then also public opinion. So there's been a lot of public opinion polls that have said that the public supports this bill because they want to be tough on crime and so on. But when you look a little deeper into those uh, into those surveys, um, those public opinion polls, you'll see that they're not specifying what crimes, and they're not specifying how you're dealing with those crimes. They're just saying like, yeah, tough on crime, put, put criminals away. So the public isn't informed about the implications of, of what they're doing. It's just like, okay, yeah, we're tough on crime, vote for us, and people do. So, um, I just want to share a story that I heard yesterday from a, a client uh, that I work with. Um, just to give you an idea of the state of our prison systems and how they deal with mental, the mentally ill and addicted population. So this is a gentleman who's, um, who's, who's recently stopped drinking after many, many years of binge drinking. Um, and he has some cognitive deficiencies as a result of that. Um, he was uh, having some, I won't get into the nitty gritty details just so that I don't identify this person, but there was some crime related, some violent crime related to um, delusions that he was having while drinking and on, on uh, a certain prescription medication that he doesn't recall, okay, and it happened with the same victim several times. So this victim has a restraining order against him. And he's, uh, he, he broke the, the, he, not in a violent way, but he did break the conditions of his, of his, uh, bail or, or whatever that was. And so there was a warrant out. He turned himself in, in an interview with the mental health nurse at the jail on his first day. Um, she, he was asked uh, a bunch of questions, and the last question was, um, "Were you, are you suicidal?" And he said, "Yes, I've been thinking of suicide because I, I snore so loud that when I've been in prison before, I've been, my life has been threatened. I've been beaten up uh, pretty badly, and so he was very scared. And because of that, he just would have rather killed himself than come and turn himself in. But he did turn himself in." So what happens to someone when they're suicidal? Normally we would want to gather around that person and help them in any way we could, but not in our prison system. This gentleman, who when he's sober, which he is in jail, keep in mind, is extremely gentle, non-violent, has no history of violence in, the, in that state of mind, um, and has a very... Uh, difficult to deal with anxiety disorder where panic attacks happen on a regular basis. He was put in a holding cell for 10 days, 24-7, with a mattress that was this thick, a blanket that was like the, so the thickness of a sheet on a cement block for 10 days, having anxiety and panic attacks for 10 days over and over and over again. Um, cell had ants all over the cell where it's covered with ants who spent his days killing ants um, and flies flying around and landing on him every 15 minutes the guards knocking on the door to see if he's still alive um, and and no no knowledge of when this was going to end and um, and uh, no and to him the food was also um, it, it didn't follow the food guide put it that way. There was no fruits and vegetables for all of those 10 days. So, and also it was a dark room. There was a light in the room, but no, no daylight. So I'm just telling you this, it's not, not necessarily to do with this bill, but 
it's just to to exam like we need to think about where we're putting people like this is Canada we're supposed to be a humane society that deals with even criminals deserve to be treated in a humane way and uh, when I heard this story I was shaken um, because you know we should have a, a prison system that at least uh, knows how to deal with people who are suicidal in a way that that is helpful and that certainly was not was not helpful to this individual um, okay, so I'm just going to read something on the social determinants of health. Um, so basically the World Health Organization with great, uh, great financial and, um, and uh, personal, like we, we sent a lot of people to the World Health Organization from Canada and money to develop what's called the social determinants of health, uh, which are, which is basically uh, states the the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, including the health system. And these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at the global, national, and local levels, which are influenced by policy choices. They're mostly responsible for health inequities, um, which is like the, the differences between health status, both within countries, so in Canada, and, the, and between countries. Um, so can, while Canada has been leading the way in developing the social determinants of health, implementing them in, or taking them into consideration in any of the policy making has not really been apparent, especially with regards to this bill. So my question is, which I don't know if there'll be an answer for, is why is Canada interested in being a part of the World Health Organization and supporting this type of uh, policy direction when they don't take it on and implement it uh, here in Canada. When I do, when I talk about the impacts, I'm also looking from a feminist perspective, which is a lens that recognizes that women's health is interconnected with children's health, which means that if we don't look after our women in a certain way, um, then we're also not looking after the children, and they're likely to grow up uh, with the same social determinants of health, basically, and the same risk factors as their mothers, okay? And fathers are also taken into account. I will say that, um, you know, putting men in prisons also has an impact, taking them away from their families that we need to consider. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to talk uh, the impacts of the bill on women specifically. Between, I don't have the most recent numbers, but between 1997 and 2006, the number of women in federal prison grew by 22%. Uh, and women are affected differently by incarceration than men, for many reasons. Um, 